Today we're going to talk about cybernetic health and what that means for the future of medicine. My name is Nitish Nag and I'm an MD-PhD student at UC Irvine. Excited to take you to, through this lecture. So as healthcare moves forward, there's a strong bridge between technology and medicine that's developing. But why technology? Technology is scalable. We can deploy it throughout the world really easily. Connectivity provides networking access to information that you wouldn't have otherwise. Sensors are gathering data continuously throughout our days, and technology is integrated into our everyday life with things such as our smartphones. But who cares about all this right now and integrating technology with medicine in terms of scientific research? Former President Barack Obama signed the Precision Medicine Initiative when he was in office to further understand how we can use technology to give better medicine to people. Furthermore, the Center for Medicare Services also gave an EHR incentive program to force hospital systems to switch over to electronic records. Industry has been very active in developing technology platforms such as Google, IBM, Fitbit, Apple, 23andMe are just some examples. In addition to that, the healthcare industry with all of the insurance companies are switching over to more high-tech ways to understand their patients. In academia, Stanford just understood how to use deep learning to identify skin cancer. And in another paper in Nature Communications, they understood how to do arrhythmia risk stratification of patients using personalized heart models. And this is all done computationally, whether it's imaging, or data analysis. The public also has been getting more involved in understanding their own health. S platforms such as Google Fit or Apple Health Kit have made it easier for apps to integrate health information between each other. And globally, smartphone use has become a common thread, whether you're in a third world country or in an extremely developed country. So access to technology and information is just accelerating. So just to bring an idea of how technology expertise can filter down to the common people, let's take a look at some history. In 1440, the printing press was invented, allowing people to read things that would have been very expensive. In 1816, the camera was invented, and this was a very high-tech device that only a few people could use at the time namely photographers. In 1833, the computer was invented by Charles Babbage as a quantitative way to analyze data. And in the 1950s onwards, the US military developed ARPANET, and which has now developed into what we know as the internet. All of these things give people expert information technology and enables them to use it for their own purposes. So what do expert technology systems do? They bring needs and resources together by bridging the needs with the correct resources. So if you're looking for news, you type in a search article on Google, you'll get the resource that you're looking for. That's your need. But what we want to do is we want to bring the expertise of medicine to the common people. And we want them to be able to easily access medicine, both from a preventive standpoint and from a treatment standpoint. But we need a common thread in order to start doing this. So what's the problem in healthcare and medicine right now? It's very reactionary in the sense that when you get sick, that's when you approach healthcare. It's hospital-based. A lot of your health is taken care of at a hospital, and it's not done in your daily life. We mostly focus on diseases and understanding how to treat diseases instead of understanding how to prevent diseases. And a lot of the times when you go to the hospital, they give you a temporary fix that just makes you feel okay for the moment, but it doesn't actually address the large problem at hand. So as you can see here, these are all the different types of costs associated with various diseases. And over here, we have a lot of conditions that can be prevented through your daily life activities, such as your eating habits, your exercise, and your mental status. So, this is a big portion of our healthcare expenditure. 
As we further look into what causes death, we see that heart disease is killing the most number of people. And heart disease also has the largest amount of preventive measures that can be taken to prevent it, the disease from happening in the first place. So there are two basic aspects to this health problem. There are things that you can readily control right here, and there are things that are harder to control. So for example, you can easily control your physical activity, your physical inputs, such as what nutrition you're eating or what air you're breathing, and your mental status, which you may have a lot more control over. Things that are harder to control may include your genetics, and with advances like CRISPR-Cas9 and other future scientific discoveries, we may be able to control genetics a little bit better. Maybe your childhood or your history and your socioeconomic status, those are harder to change. And maybe your location, you work somewhere and you don't have a choice to work somewhere else. But what we're going to do is we're going to focus on things that cause physiologic change and that you can readily control because that gives the power of healthcare into everybody's hands. So how are we going to do this using computer science? Right now we're in a huge boom of getting what we call big data. And big data is data that is a lot of volume. It's coming in really fast. It's always streaming and you have a large variety in the type of data. We need to understand how to make this useful. And this is actually the biggest challenge right now in computational science. So to make sense of all this is only going to help us control what we want to achieve. So for example, if we want to control health, we need to be able to measure your health at any given time. So we're going to use two basic tools in our research. The first tool is understanding how to bring data into semantic understanding. And the second is using cybernetic control theory. So let's dive into data semantics. So what is semantics? Semantics is understanding what this object is right here. This is an apple. We all know this as humans because we can understand what the pixels in our eyes are showing us. A computer sees an apple like this as a bunch of zeros and ones. And what we want to do is we want to bridge this data and help the computer understand that this is actually an apple. And this gap between the numbers here and this object is called the semantic gap. So basically bringing data into an understandable format and bridging that is called the semantic gap. So what are the two big things that are semantics in our lives? There's objects and there's events. And these two things describe all physical space and time, essentially. If you have relationships between objects and the events that take place between them, that essentially describes the Einsteinian physical time and space. So how do we understand objects and events in the real world? So computer deep learning algorithms have become much better at understanding objects. So for example, this can over here can understand that this is a banana and that these are all oranges here and then the computer can identify where the, that is in the picture. Same thing over here for this family room setup. But what we have trouble right now with is understanding how to get all these streams of data that could be related to your health and making sense of what they actually are in your real life. So to do that, we transform all of these events into something we can understand. And that would be something like eating breakfast, sleeping, walking. And these things are events we can understand as humans to interpret. So what is an event? An event has a few aspects to it. There's time, there's the space that it's happening in, there's information related to the event, what the experience of the event is like, a cause of the event, and substructures of the event. For example, a larger event having smaller sub-events. This can occur at both a cellular level or it can occur at a global level. For example, a DNA uh, enzyme trying to duplicate DNA has events happening at the microscopic level. But if you're talking about events taking place, let's say, on a political landscape, you're looking at states and countries, which is a much larger time space. So this is a general universal framework. So why events? Events are a great level of abstraction for computation. And just as we have images, and the pixels from the images can be identified to be objects, such as this tissue can be understood to have objects. 
Events are the same way. We can take events and understand how to make them into understandable events. So the next tool we're going to talk about is cybernetics. And cybernetics is the simple principle of communications and control in both machines and living things. And this was described by Norbert Wiener in the 1940s. So how does cybernetics work? In theory, you have a desired state that you want, and you have a model which models what this desired state should be like and how the world around it operates. You sense that there's a difference between the desired state and your model, and so you give it a control signal to your live system to change something, and that changes the actual state. And then you sense what's going on in the real world and see if that reduces the difference of your disparity. Now, this all sounds fancy. Let's take this to a really simple concept. So in your house, you may have a thermostat, and this is just actually mechanical cybernetics. When your temperature goes below 72 degrees, you turn on the heater, and when it comes back up to 72 degrees, you turn off the heater. And that's exactly what cybernetic control is. And mechanical cybernetic control systems can be applied to complex machines, for example, an airplane with a cockpit having multiple controls that are all being cybernetically controlled. But in the body, we also have physiologic cybernetics. For example, if your pancreas produces insulin, it's controlling the, the sugar that's released in your body. Excess sugar triggers the insulin response, and when sugar levels drop in the blood, the insulin stops in a healthy individual. And so for unhealthy individuals or people who don't have a pancreas that's functioning, we have a fusion of both mechanical and physiologic systems to provide control for the blood sugar. But this is only a simple task, controlling blood sugar. Controlling lifestyle habits such as nutrition and activity and exercise and mental status require much more complex and scalable systems. So how are we going to do that? The first step is understanding how we're going to use data to accelerate our current medical practice into what we call future health systems. And those things include sensors, your genetics, the internet, using networking power, and imaging. But we need to bring all this together. So the way that future health systems have been developing recently is that people are trying to understand who exactly are you. And this is what we call personalized medicine, understanding what the patient or individual is composed of. The second step is understanding how to predict what will happen to that person. So when, re when will your health status change? The third step is understanding how we can give you precise targeted solutions for your changing health to ensure that it's going in the best direction. The fourth aspect is how do we persuade you to make sure you want to participate in developing good health? And lastly, we want to focus on preventing disease. We want to avoid and control your health so that way we can avoid diseases. So we bring this together in our research by bringing a cybernetic fusion of these future health ideas. So once we understand who you are, we want to take that and predict what's going on with you. Using these predictions, we want to be able to give you precise solutions. We want to be able to persuade you to enact these solutions. And then we can see the prevention of any problems that might have occurred. And this gives you feedback back into your personalized self. And this we call P5 cybernetic health. So let's take a look at the first part of P5 cybernetic health and how we understand the person. So in ancient times, we used to talk about ourselves and pass on our data through anecdotal and, uh, and audio descriptions of us basically through verbal dissemination. Talk about some ancient king, the story gets passed down, etc. As writing developed, we start talking about diarizing ourselves. So writing an autobiography or a story about someone's life. Much more recently, we've developed this idea of quantified self. So understanding our, our lives in numbers. So for example, tracking how many steps you take or what you're eating. But one step beyond that is the objective self, which is understanding all of the quantified information in a semantically understandable way. So this is how we want to represent ourselves. And we call this the life jiva. 
And we basically take all of the user's sensors and signals, we take all of this raw data together, and combine it with expert knowledge and the real-time environment to give a live picture of what's happening to you in real life. And through this, we want to be able to have you interact with your data. So how are we going to do that? We basically take your body and we divide it into different resolution levels. So this could be a single person, and that's just represented as one voxel. A voxel is basically a cube to, to representing 3D time and space. At the same time, we can maybe go into a higher resolution to represent data that affects your limbs. For example, your exercise from your accelerometers, or what parts of your body are getting light exposure to see if you're getting enough vitamin D. We could further go on to the organ level, tissue level, cellular, or genetic level to basically understand how we can put the data together in a meaningful and understandable format. So once we have your entire self, and we transform this into a voxelized human representation of yourself, we can start to have a better understanding of who you are. The next step we want to do is we want to predict what's going to happen to you. So the way we're going to do that is we take the understanding that every event has a cause and an effect. And through the observation streams of data we're getting, whether it's from your heart rate monitor, your Fitbit, your cell phone, other sensors that are being developed in the future, we want to understand how we can combine these into understandable events. From these events and the relationships between them, we can understand if a certain situation is developing. When we understand the situation, we can verify that it's happening in the real world by going back to the data and seeing if our situation understanding matches what's happening in the data. So in this event detection, we'll understand what the co-occurrences are happening between two different events. And from that, we can give you a probability of causation. Now we're not saying co not, we're not saying co-occurrence is equal to causation. We're just saying it has a probability of causation, in the sense that if you wake up every morning and you have a glass of tea, the probability of you having a glass of tea the next day is very high. And so we build these concept lattices to understand how these relationships are bonded together between events. And through this, we're developing a system to take both environmental data and your wearable sensors in addition to your virtual data, for example, the notes you write down or your schedule or your computer usage, and putting these together into what we call the personicle. And the personicle is essentially your lifeline of different events. We track patterns in this and we build what we call the objective self to understand what's going on. Next step is we want to develop precise solutions for any emerging problems. The problem is, for most people, human biology is too complex to understand. Here's an example of metabolic syndrome, which encompasses diabetes, obesity, uh, and other blood problems. This is all related together, and here you can see that these diagrams are extremely complex for someone to understand and operate using them, including physicians. So what we want to do is we want to take all of these and make them into simple and filtered actionable information. So you should be able to know what to do next to best affect your health. And the way we're going to do that is, for example, in nutrition. By understanding the objects in your food, we can give nutrition analysis. And based on metadata from the, that nutrition analysis, we can optimize what you should be eating next. And we can also quantify what your nutrition score is, essentially telling you how healthy have you been eating. And through this, we can give you feedback as to what you should eat next to better your health. The next step is to persuade you to participate in eating healthier or any other activity that may be better for your health. So we all have this problem of, oh, do I eat the cake or do I eat the apple? And this happens to us every day and we don't even realize it sometimes. So what we want to do with our persuasion technology is we want to basically take all of your preferences and put them on a plot and understand which ones are healthier and which ones are unhealthy. And when you get hungry, we call this a natural trigger, your tendency to execute on a certain resource or capability will increase, such as, I'm gonna go get food now, so I'm gonna go in my car and drive to a restaurant. At that time, we wanna tilt your preferences so that way you are essentially given more convenient access to, to preferences that are healthier. 
and your less convenient access to preferences that are unhealthy. And so when you actually go to buy food at the restaurant, it's very easy and convenient for you to actually choose the healthier option. And that we use a synthetic trigger, which essentially could be a smartphone app or any other similar device for you to make the actionable choice of choosing what you like, but also what is healthy. And so what we're doing with this is we're basically giving you optimal decision making in your control. So you are the choice maker in making yourself healthier. The next step is we want to see prevention. And ultimately, prevention is the big goal for a lot of medicine. The CDC has put a lot of effort into understanding how we can increase preventive medicine. And they've released a report that you can check out here. All of our systems combine together to basically do this needs resource matching we talked about earlier. So one of our platforms that we've developed in the Ramesh Jain lab is called Event Shop. Event Shop basically takes all of the sensors that are giving environmental information and in real time can understand what's going on. So let's say in this example, we have menus for restaurants that are all aggregated and understood so you understand what resources are available to you outside. At the same time, using our personal event shop, which basically understands your jiva, who you are, developing your quantified model, and understanding your evolving situation, we can understand how to match your needs for that situation, for example, hunger, with what best items in the environment can match that need. And through that, we give you an actionable item for you to take. So a clinical application we're working on in early stages is in diabetes. And we want to help patients improve their insulin sensitivity, and we want to improve their blood markers and improve their body weight. And these have all been shown to help diabetes patients. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to quantify their nutrition, their activity, their mental status, and their medical dosing. And through this quantification, we can give feedback. And feedback is the key principle of cybernetics. So we call this Health Butler, and we're implementing at the Gottschalk Diabetes Center. Here's an example of some screenshots from Health Butler. Here you can see an easy way to understand what food is available around you, and how it would affect your A1C score, how far it is for you to go to, and the flavor profile to see what you would best find tasty. Here you can see a recording system for easily capturing all the food you're eating. And here you can see a predicted insulin resistance based on food and activity going up. So this may cause a trigger for you to book a doctor's appointment for you to check on your diabetes status. All of our systems have further broad applications from anywhere from understanding epidemiology to retail, finance, social, and travel applications. In this lecture, I'll limit this talk to just the diabetes. I'd like to acknowledge our lab members who've helped a lot in bringing this vision together. Our professor Ramesh Jain and his visionary approach has been fantastic in developing all of these ideas. Lale Jalali and Jordan O oh have spent a lot of time developing the objective self and ways to measure this through life tracking. Event Shop had strong support from Ming Fang and Sirpin who developed the essence of how to understand information in the environment, and our newer lab members, Jonathan and Vibhav. And I'd like to thank the support from UC Irvine, the Edwards Life Sciences Center for Advanced Cardiovascular Technology, the UCI Medical Scientist Training Program, the Donald Brown School of Information and Department of Computer Science, and the National Institute of Health. And with that, I hope you guys enjoyed this presentation. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me at, on my email. And if you have any s comments about this, please click on the QR code or type in the tiny URL and you can give me feedback on this presentation or ideas you may have.